Good morning and welcome to Parsons. My name is Joel Towers. I'm the Executive Dean of Parsons. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here today. Um, I appreciate your coming out in the snow and rain. And um, uh, as I was saying to one of our colleagues, if you have to choose your storms in New York, I think snow is better than hurricane. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll be pleasant, sort of quiet, the city is beautiful in the snow. Um, but it is, a, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to Parsons and to this Fashion Colloquium New York, the fourth in the Fashion Colloquia series that uh, began in London in the spring of 2000, uh, in September of 2011 and was followed by Milan last spring, Paris last fall, and of course arrives here now in New York to coincide with Fashion Week here as it did in each of those previous cities. Indeed, the links between Fashion Week, urban culture, um, the interwoven local and global economic ecosystem of the fashion industry is at the core of these events that were so brilliantly conceived and realized by the many scholars, designers, industry partners who have worked tirelessly to pull them off. Uh, it, we are indebted to all of them. Uh, and in thanking a few now, I will undoubtedly leave out others unintentionally. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank Ian King uh, and Francis Corner from London College of Fashion, uh, Barbara Trebish from Domus Academy, uh, Dominique Jacquemet from IFM, and of course our own Fiona Diffenbacher, uh, Simon Collins, uh, Timo Rosanen, and Sarah Kozlowski of Parsons. Um, we're pleased to be the New York conveners and the partners in this, in this series of events. And we welcome our colleagues, not just um, from around the world, but also the other New York City design schools that are here, the New York fashion industry, and of course, our students, those who've made it in, um, several of them calling my office saying, are we really open today? <laughs> uh, events like this curriculum, uh, this colloquia, are really critical co-curricular activities for the school. Um, they uh, not only uh, do they link the school to the design industry um, and the cultural condition of New York and design uh, globally, but they are the ways in which our integrated curriculum functions um, across those spaces. And it is in that spirit that I will um, be pleased in just a moment to, to introduce my colleague, Simon Collins, uh, the dean of the School of Fashion here at Parsons, who will make some brief remarks on his campaign against bad design. Uh, but before I bring Simon up here, I do want to just make one other quick announcement. Of course, remind you, I have to say this in my official um, capacity, to, uh, to do check announcements in case uh, the storm does get a lot worse. We will uh, certainly make um, communications about any later events that we might need to cancel if that is, is indeed the case. Um, we are uh, still holding tonight's um, celebration of the uh, Sophie Gimbel show that uh, Beth Dinkoff uh, from Parsons uh, curated and which now resides in our Fifth Avenue Aronson galleries and in the hallways outside of that space. Um, it is how we will end today's activities uh, with a conversation between Beth um, and uh, Helen O'Hagan. Um, I think Simon may participate in that conversation as well, if I'm not mistaken. I can't quite remember the last bit of it. I just put you on the agenda, Simon, I think. <laughs> just the two, okay. Um, and then we will have a reception uh, at six o'clock and watch the snowfall together. It's beautiful big windows and um, a glass of champagne and, and then we'll send you off into the quiet of the New York City snowy evening. So um, please do stay with us for that event. Um, and, it, and I sadly will depart briefly, but I will come back um, much happier when I come back to this event later in the, in the day. Uh, but I am pleased now to uh, welcome the Dean of the School of Fashion here at Parsons, Simon Collins. Uh, morning, everyone. Thank you, Joel. Uh, very kind. Um, so uh, what a pleasure to see you all. Uh, here in New York at our school. I was lucky enough to go to the last colloquium, which was wonderful in Paris, and I heard great reports of the, uh, the inaugural one in London and, and the subsequent one in Italy. Um, what I thought I'd do to start off was just tell you a bit about our school and what we do here. Um, Fiona's book, which many of you came to the reading of last night, uh, I think does a wonderful job of explaining what we teach and how we teach it, um, and how open we are to new ways of teaching. Uh, and, and I, and I couldn't dream of explaining it any better than Fiona does. 
Um, so I'm going to focus on the other things that we do, because of course we know that fashion is not just about what you wear. Indeed, not for nothing do we call our new uh, MFA program Fashion Design and Society. Uh, and we're very conscious of that. We're also very conscious of the business that's around us. Um, it's interesting that uh, there are places in the world, uh, in the fashion industry, where people look slightly sideways at us for caring about the business because they feel like design should be pure and unaffected by mere commercial constraints. Um, but we don't think that. We know you have to make a living. Um, and so I am lucky enough to go around the world and talk about what we do. Uh, we, we, you know, just as our colleagues from other schools are, we're quite well known for what we do. And so uh, around the world, people want to hear about how we do it. Um, and so as I put together um, my random thoughts on turning a design school into a global brand, uh, I came up with um, uh, the idea of creating beautiful solutions, because that's, I think, what we do. That's what design really is. Uh, without a challenge, there's no real, nothing to respond to. And so it's a solution. And we create that solution, of course, because we're designers. Um, and if it's not beautiful, we don't really want it. We don't really want ugly solutions. Uh, and you'll forgive me, I hope, um, as we progress towards total world domination. So uh, Simon Collins, uh, I've been the dean here for five years, and I spent 20-something years before that as a designer and a creative director. Um, I didn't have um, a day's worth of academic training before I took this role, which was very, very bold. Um, a friend of mine at Harvard said that if they did that there, they'd all walk out en masse. Um, and Parsons was courageous to put someone like me in this role. Um, I think it was a reflection on the innovative nature of the school, and I think it was a confidence in the faculty in the 116 years that had gone before that Parsons pretty much knew what they were doing. They were just interested in a new voice. Uh, so we ask very difficult questions. Uh, we like to be provocative. This is just an example. Um, I was speaking at a conference a little while ago, and it was about sustainability, and it was filled with CEOs, and my solution to them was um, along those lines. So it's not perhaps the most finessed argument, but I think it did spark uh, an interesting conversation. And uh, in this particular role, just as I'm sure many of you enjoy, uh, I represent 1,600 fashion students and 250 staff. And so I do ask provocative questions, and I don't care if people find that difficult. Uh, in fact, I quite like it. If they, if they don't find it difficult, I'm probably not asking smart enough questions. This is us. Um, some of you might have seen this. They make a television show in our building. Um, and as a result, uh, the buses draw up outside, and people with little plastic ponchos in the rain take pictures of us. Uh, we're the only stop on the Garment Center tour. Uh, and these are the people that have been through our school. Uh, I'm sure you'll recognize some of them. Um, they're mainly New York designers, but as you can see, a very international crew. Uh, we, our graduates dominate the, internet, uh, the New York landscape of design and increasingly are found around the world. Indeed, it's, uh, it's unusual at this point to find a, um, a well-known design team that doesn't have someone from our school in it. Um, I'm sure that, again, I'm sure that's the case for many of the other schools represented here, but uh, this is the one that I know about. Um, we know Donna Karen, of course, top left, who in many ways is the matriarch of our school at this point. Uh, Donna takes a very keen interest in what goes on here and endowed our MFA program. Uh, she was inspired to come to the school by Claire McCardle, um, who in many ways invented ready-to-wear, and some people might look a little bit askance at us saying that, but it's true. Um, and Donna inspired Narciso to come, and Narciso inspired Jack and Lazaro to come. Jack and Lazaro inspired a whole other generation of designers to come. So it's, it's very much a cyclical process. One of the things we talk about here is brilliance only. Um, we like to do all kinds of different things, and the criteria for us doing something is can we do it brilliantly? That's what we're interested in. We love saying no. We won't do things. If we don't think that it's something we can bring real value to and do brilliantly, we won't do it. Um, there are lots of other rules here, lots of other guidelines, uh, but that one is really core. Uh, here you can see uh, a skirt on the left. That was made by a student that I think had been studying fashion for about six weeks. Um, we innovate here, <clears throat> and sometimes we innovate to a point where people get a bit annoyed. They'd rather we just learn to do something and then do it for a little while, but we don't do that. We can't do that. We wouldn't be in, this, in the design industry if we could do that. We have to innovate. And so, uh, for many, many years, we uh, were very, very successful at teaching people the basics. We did that, and they then took those basics and did great things with them. Um, but as we evolved, and Fiona certainly did a far better job than I ever could of explaining how this works, but as we evolved, we realized that we could teach them the basics, and as they were learning them, they could be experimenting with them. It sounds obvious, but 
doesn't go on as much as we would like, uh, so now it does. That skirt, instead of making a pencil skirt, which any of us that studied fashion, myself included, know that that's how you start, uh, we teach them to make a pencil skirt and then say, now you know how to do that, make something different, and that's an example of it. Um, we've got some nice friends, uh, and uh, we get to do exciting things. This was something which, um, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I always forget to not name drop. Um, anyway, this is something that the British government came to me and said, can you do that for us? Uh, LVMH came to us and said, can we highlight the work of artisans because we believe that there's a dying art all around us and we want to do something about it. So we did. So we said, yeah, we'll get involved. And what it turned into was an eight-page supplement in the New York Times and a party on Governor's Island and a movie. Uh, which was sort of screened at a big theatre here with the publisher of the Times present and then finally a party uh, during New York Fashion Week. Now, we don't have to do these things because, of course, it's all about the academic experience. And we're very, very aware of ensuring that everything we do carries uh, with it an academic experience that is beneficial to the student and, and the staff member. But rarely does that mean staying in the classroom and doing it. More often than not, it means getting out there and doing it in real time with real partners. So we deliver something. Uh, and I think not least the experience of working as a team and on a myriad of different media uh, is incredibly beneficial to our students. So this was an example of that. Uh, we like to think that we push the boundaries of design. Uh, and so while we do a lot of things that are very commercially viable, and we're very proud of that, we also have people like this guy, um, Giuseppe who came to us. He owns um, Iris, which is one of the biggest shoemakers in Italy. Uh, they make shoes for Christian Dior and Marc Jacobs and, and all the other big brands you care to name. And he feels like his designers aren't challenged because everything they do has got to go down the runway and then get sold. So he came to us and said, will you please design things that we can't make? Because I want to train our uh, sample rooms and our, our creative people how to work on new things. Uh, and he loves making shoes. Um, and so you can imagine anyone else who's in their sort of um, twilight years might be relaxing on a beach or something. But he gets on a plane with his little bag and he comes into us and he brings his leather um, lasts, uh, sorry, his lasts and his, his leather uppers. And he cuts them out with the students and he works with them because he loves to do it. And we like people like that. We work very closely with them. So we've worked with him for a few years now. And they simply make shoes for our students because they like the challenge, and you can see there. And, and what I love is he, he comes in and he sort of looks at what the students have designed, and you can see his mind going, how am I going to make that? How's it going to happen? And he, and he loves the challenge of it. Um, we work with Louis Vuitton, uh, which is a movable feast. Um, on the right, uh, we, they, they came to us and said, what can you do? You know, we want to work with you. We've heard things are going on. What can we do together? And we said, Ugh, you know, you don't need any more dresses. We don't need any more of the things you already do. And we thought, if Louis Vuitton could do something with some sort of sustainable element, that could be very influential. And so we came up with the concept of reconstruction, where we took the Louis Vuitton collection, um, every sample they had from the year, and we turned it in the first year on the right into outfits for a classical music ensemble. The music ensemble serenaded our students, who will be in the, our gallery, which you'll see later on, for a 10-hour period. Uh, and we, <laughs> we encouraged our students to take the collection and cut it up and repurpose it. And so you can imagine the furore here, because everything is instant news. So the news cameras are all pressed against the window, saying, what are you doing? Thousands and thousands of dollars worth of samples are being massacred, uh, which we loved. So they made these classical music ensemble uh, costumes, and they did a subsequent concert the following week. Uh, so that, for us, is it's more than what you wear. Uh, on the left, uh, for the second year, um, version of this, Reconstruction 2.0, we went into the Louis Vuitton store and we cut the collection up to make travel blankets because their, feel, their theme is life is a journey. Uh, and so that was exciting because the students are in a store in Soho uh, and Pete is sort of roped off like a, like a velvet rope VIP room. And um, people are buying $3,000 jackets and we're cutting them up at the same time, which was challenging. But I've got to say that I loved um, Vuitton's point of view at the time because they were well up for it. They were all about, what can we do that's going to just be creative? Uh, we love it when people come to our events and look around and go, how do you do this? What is it you're doing? How do you get to do this? So we do um, our fashion benefit, and uh, you can see it on the left there. Um, a thousand people come to watch a runway show at noon, and then we turn the room around, and 700 people have a black tie dinner in the evening, and we raise anything from one and a half to three million dollars for scholarships. 
We also showcase our designers from the BFA program on the runway. We select our designer of the year and we have our friends come in to accept awards and honours. So it's very much the gala mo model which people are familiar with, but we don't settle for that. We don't do round tables and white table, uh, white table cloths and a bunch of speeches. We do something that people go away going, this is amazing, how do you do this? What are you? And the way we do that is by bringing our friends in, our partners, to create things that they didn't know they could do. So we'll bring a film company in and we'll challenge them in a way that no one challenges them because we're not a corporation. We're not selling anything. Um, we keep our alumni close. Uh, they inspire our students and they come in and they share wisdom. Uh, you can see there uh, Isabel Toledo uh, and her husband Ruben, Jack and Lazaro from Proenza. Uh, Derek Lamb and uh, Jenna Lyons, who were contemporaries at school and great friends and took very different career paths, but uh, are still in touch. And then Reed Krakoff, uh, bottom right, who is the man behind Coach. Uh, it's really heartening to see the, the, how much they care about the industry. It's interesting, you know, the, a lot of people are aware of the New York design industry through that television show uh, that they make at our school. Uh, and it's such a, a warped perspective. I mean, it's a reality show, so it should be whatever it needs to be to sell the advertising that it exists for. But uh, it doesn't in any way reflect the New York industry. What the New York industry is all about is people become very successful and then they go back and help the next generation of designers. And we feel very good about that. Uh, we like to think we've got some really good friends who care about us here. Uh, those of you from other places may not be quite as familiar with them, but it's the great and the good of fashion. It's um, Carol and um, Humberto on the right from opening ceremony, and Alex Wang, our alumni, of course, and John Dempsey, who's the head of. Uh, I think L'Oreal, I forget which one. Susie Menkes, of course, we know Jack and Lazaro, who are our graduates, and the trap on the right is probably one of the most influential people in fashion. Uh, Rassi, he owns Milk Studios. Everything that's worth looking at was shot there, pretty much, if it was shot in this country. Uh, he also launched, along with a couple of friends, Made, which is the new version of Fashion Weeks in its sixth season now, which provides a runway for uh, up-and-coming designers for free. So I think a lot of fashion weeks around the world, those of you here that are in touch with your own fashion weeks would do well to have a look at this. Um, Milk Studios, as I say, they teamed up with Mac, hence the Mac and Milk logo, and they provide, I think, something like 40 different um, slots for a runway show or a presentation at zero cost to the designer. So we've taken advantage of that too. It's a great way of nurturing new talent. Zero waste is very important to us, um, and my friend Timo, uh, Professor Timo Rissenen, is going to be, I'm sure, touching upon that a little bit later. Um, here's a great way to ruin someone's life. Put them on the cover of the style section of the Times and say that they're the expert in sustainability. Uh, is Timo here? Yeah, there he is. So we, um, we put Timo uh, in this picture, and we were lucky enough to make the cover of the style section uh, during a summer weekend. And thereafter, every single person in the world who wants to get involved in sustainability emailed Timo personally. He had to go into the witness protection program because uh, it just got out of hand. Um, but it was, it was a good way. I mean, this is a, actually, I've got to say something about this project. This project was where uh, Timo and his class designed uh, zero waste garments, which I'm not going to explain because I'm confident everyone in this room knows what they are. Um, and when we were putting it together, we wanted a partner. So we went to a, one of our friends who is a, a huge uh, jeans retailer in this country, <coughs> actually globally, um, and we said, do you want to do it? And they said, well, let's have a chat with our marketing people first. And we said, <laughs> no, 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 no. This is not about marketing. This is about um, uh, something conceptual and something worth doing. If you don't believe in it, then you know, we'll come back to you. So we worked with uh, Loom State. You can see the two designers, uh, Rogan and uh, Scott. Uh, and Julie Gilhart, who hitherto was the uh, fashion director of Barney's, uh, is the, the lady in the hat. And so we did this project. It worked brilliantly. It was on the cover of the Times. And the very next day, that previously men not mentioned jeans retailer rang us up and said, can you tell us how to do it? And that was a turning point, because um, we're all familiar with other institutions that receive hundreds of millions of dollars worth of funding to build a new wing in honor of a chemical company that wants them to do research for them. And it's a pretty standard model in science and technology and all that sort of thing, which is great, but it doesn't happen in fashion. And we wish it did. So we felt that, just as I started off by saying we push buttons in the industry, we also want to pioneer things that the industry doesn't have the time or the mind space or the cash for. And that's what we've been doing. And that's why people are now coming to us more and more. Uh, this is an example of the cross-disciplinary uh, nature of what we do here. This is the Empower House. So uh, every year, uh, every two years actually, there's a competition called the Solar Decathlon, which is where uh, engineering schools and design schools, or sometimes just engineering schools, build a house. And it has to be a sustainable house. 
um, uh, using zero energy. And they build them on the National Mall in Washington, and they get exhibited, and then the winner gets chosen. Well, Stevens College in Jersey, which is an engineering school, very respected, teamed up with Par uh, Parsons and the new school here. Um, and we designed it in a way that these things have never been done before. Uh, we won, there were several prizes. We won one of them. I think it was for the most cost-effective house. Um, but we did went one step further, and this is where I, I like to think that we pushed the boundaries. You can see on the left the house in situ. That may be a sketch, but it's real now. We built this house. Instead of taking it to bits and recycling it, we rebuilt it in the Ninth Ward in Washington, which is one of the poorest wards in the country, and we gave it to two families. Now, that to us is, is going back to our, our concept of fashion is more than just what you wear. In this instance, of course, it was architecture, but we are very concerned with the end result. We like to think things through and see them way beyond the point where we remain owning them. Um, we, have, we are aware of what goes on in the world, as, as many of people are, and we like to think it informs our design. Uh, this is a competition we did with MCM, the Korean-owned uh, German handbag company. Uh, they said to us, we don't know what you do, but we want to do something special. So we said, how about if we team up with our friends in Parsons who design technology, uh, and we also team up with our product design friends, and we put together a class where our fashion, product, and technology students got together and came up with ways to embed technology in accessories. Now, the reason I mentioned uh, what's going on in the world, this happened to be uh, just over a year ago, and it was shortly after the tsunami in Japan. And a Japanese student um, who had been here at the time was, was very affected, as many of us were. And so his concept was um, accessories that would protect you. So this is a lady's handbag, you can see on the right, uh, which turns into a gas mask. Uh, he also came up with a courier bag, which you could remove the flap of and would turn into a trench coat, which was a flotation device. So not terrifically commercially viable, necessarily, although I'm sure CP Company could make this bag. Uh, but I think provocative and interesting. The bag on the right was um, something that troubles many of us, uh, and it's a self-weighing bag. So when you get to the check-in and the obnoxious clerk there tells you you're overweight, you can be prepared for that. I mentioned Donna Karen. There she is talking to our MFA class. Um, I'm afraid you're going to have to forgive me a little bit of um, humble bragging here. Uh, we're very proud of our MFA class. We really are. It was new for us. It was a new thing for American education, fashion education. Donna endowed it. Shelley Fox uh, wrote the curriculum, has been teaching, leading the teaching of it, along with Kyle Farmer and many of our other professors. Um, in the middle, you'll see um, the work of one of our first graduates who actually graduated last May. Um, this was a competition at the Met in conjunction with the Savage Beauty exhibition, the, the work of Lee McQueen. Um, and it was inspired by um, his work. And we were very, very fortunate and very proud that of our 18 students, um, four of them gained the top four places in the competition. Um, and then on the right, um, you'll see uh, that's actually the uh, Zegna Barufa stand at Pitti Filati in Italy. Um, it was another competition, and I, I, I did think very hard about putting this in because um, you know we're all friends here and we're all fellow academics, but we won that one too. <laughs> um, sorry. So, uh, but with you know we were very proud. It was our first year. You know, we we Shelley worked incredibly hard on making this, this successful, as did so many other people in our school. Uh, and it's nice to feel that it's recognized outside. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very proud of what they do. Um, we, on the right, you can see some of that work displayed actually in, uh, in London, uh, during London Fashion Week. On the left, uh, I think this is a great example of how we work here. Uh, we wanted to show the MFA in May when they graduated. So we thought, hmm, what should we do? I know. Let's go and get 28,000 raw square feet in a skyscraper down the road, donated by one of our friends. And we set it up, and we did this exhibition. And this was another one of those moments when people came in and looked around and went, how do you do this? Like, how do you do that? I don't know how we do it. I don't know. Can anyone here put their hand up and say, I can get 28,000 square feet for a month in central Manhattan? Because it, it, people just people have an inkling of what goes on at Parsons. And they want a piece of it. And they want to help. They just want to feel like they're helping. And so that's an example of how it goes. Um, this is some of the coverage we got. Um, you know, we, we, at the beginning, I said, um, you know, taking a design school and turning it into a global brand. Um, we, we're aware of that. We have a PR department. I'm sure all schools have PR departments. I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with how other schools are run. But we do. And we know that when we're written about in the New York Times, um, actually, as, just as we were yesterday, people come up to us myself and many of my colleagues, and they congratulate us on it, but it changes the perception. Like, we don't go out and ask people for things with our hand out. We go out and tell people what we do, and people come to us and say, what can I give you? 
so you can see even the, forgive me, this is a terrible thing to say, but even the French liked it. Um, just say no. We say no a lot, uh, and we like saying no. Uh, if you don't say no, then saying yes doesn't really mean much. Um, we said no recently to a very, very uh, famous um, uh, magazine, uh, which there's one of them in every one of our countries, um, and they came to us and said, would you like a runway show during New York Fashion Week? Would you like part of our website? Would you like to have your students' work featured in our book? And we said, that sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. No. And they were sort of, what do you mean? How could anyone turn that down? And we said, no, you know, I think it's fantastic, um, but we feel like what we do is, in, is, is done in a certain way at a certain level, and what you're proposing doesn't really live up to that. So thank you very much. We're very grateful, but no. And when you do say no, what happens is Christian Louboutin, when he was launching his 20-year anniversary, rang us up and said, I'm launching a collection at Bergdorf's. We're having a big party. I want to show my shoes. What am I going to put on the models? I can't go to a big brand because what am I? This is my show, not theirs. So he came to us and he knew we could deliver. And we did deliver. We were in touch with our alumni. So those five dresses you can see, outfits you can see there, um, were created by one, two, three year out of school alumni who were looking for some publicity, um, would love the idea of a party in Bergdorf, so love the idea of working with Christian. And so that's how it came about. And that to me means what we're doing is right. If we're being perceived like that, by Christian Le Boutin, then it's working. The other people that are working with us now, who came to us because they wanted something about what we're doing, include these. Um, we have a great relationship with both LVMH and PPR, uh, and they know what we do. And you know, we, we always talk to them in terms that they can understand. You know, we know what our students are capable of. We know what our staff are capable of. We've proved it over and over again. We're always looking for something new. We always tell them, we actually don't know what's going to come out the end of this. And we're really excited about that. We know it will be of a certain quality. We know it will be an innovative, inspiring. We know that your staff will benefit from the experience, as will we. But we don't really know what it is. And if you're prepared to embark on the journey with us and not quite know what's going to be at the end of it, then we'd love to have you along. Here's a few of the other people we work with. Um, we do, we, you know, we're, New York is a part of what we do, and New York is an incredibly international city, and so that makes us feel very international. Possibly 30, 32, 33% of our school is international students, um, and so that makes us who we are. You know, the new school, which you know, we're part of, was founded uh, post-war by people fleeing oppression in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. So that part of our university was founded on internationalism. You know, we've always been an international school here at Parsons, so you know, it makes total sense for us to work with Li Ning or LVMH. One of the things we tell our students is just don't give in. Uh, you'll forgive the paraphrasing of, um, of, of Churchill. I'm sure he didn't have design in mind. But um, we never do give in. We just don't. It's too bad. It's like I, I get infuriated. I mean, I, I call this the campaign against bad design. I get infuriated by bad design. I do. It makes me annoyed. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of seeing it. We don't do it in our school. We won't tolerate it. We, I, I, and I say to our students, um, don't send me an ugly email. Don't do it. Don't, 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 if you can't be bothered to write an email properly, don't write to me. And if you're going to do your resume and it doesn't look great, don't send it out. Don't insult our school by sending it out. And I, I'm intentionally provocative about that. And of course, you know, I, I actually made a speech and quoted this in uh, Madrid. And a gentleman, it was not to students, it was to industry people. Um, and uh, a gentleman, he was the head of HR for LVMH. He said, well, who decides what great design is, what good design is? Which is a great question. And I, the answer is, I do. And you do. And so does everyone else in this room. And the longer you've been exposed to good design, perhaps slightly more attention will be paid to your opinion. But ultimately, we all have to believe it. We all have to be invested in it. And if we don't tolerate it, then perhaps it will go away and people will think a little bit harder about it. Create beautiful solutions. That's what I mentioned earlier on. Um, this is what we do. It's, uh, the reason I came up with this, actually, was um, uh, it's interesting how se seemingly irrelevant things spark ideas. Um, but I got my picture taken, and someone said, what do you do? And I told him. And he said, no, that doesn't work. I've only got three words. What can you do? Can you describe it in three words? And I felt this was a way of describing what we do in three words. Um, <laughs> this is, I always use this. And people, I've never yet done a presentation where people don't go, oh, yeah. 
because it's such an obvious one. Of course we should be nice, it's obvious. But so many people aren't, and especially here, I mean, New York is proud of being a tough place and everyone gets things done and all that. But the people that are successful are actually really nice about it because you want to do it. You want to work with them. You know, it's, it's I mean, we're here, of course, to talk about um, uh, academics and fashion. Uh, and that's, you know, we've got to do that. But I don't want to have that conversation with someone I don't think is being nice about it. And I, forgive me if this feels like I'm saying something that is better said to kindergarten students. Um, I've never yet um, been in a situation at a conference or anywhere else where people haven't nodded and sort of thought, ah, you know what, that member of staff I've got, they would have been a lot more successful if they were actually nice about what they're doing. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what this word means. Um, I looked it up, uh, and it does mean what I'm about to explain. Uh, but Italians always go, we never say that. Um, spettatura is a term from 100 years ago um, where it was for fops um, who had nothing better to do than try and do everything elegantly. And so that's what they did. And so if it meant drinking a cup of tea elegantly, that's what they did. Or if it, in our day, I think if it means writing a text elegantly, that's what they do. I follow Twitter and I see certain tweets from certain reputable brands and can't be bothered to read them because they haven't bothered to think about how it looks. They can't be bothered to be elegant with their tweet. So we can ignore that. Anyone can say it doesn't matter. It's about information exchange and all that. You know, It's the idea that's important. I don't think so. I think everything we do should be elegant, everything. And if we start to feel that way, and we start to behave that way, and we start to educate our students to think that way, then I think they're going to be more interested in design. So just to summarize, um, creating beautiful solutions in the campaign against bad design, uh, I find I'm sure many of you do. When we speak to the media and when we give speeches and when we talk to students, they've only got the capacity to write down a little bit. They, they're not going to remember everything you say. And so for me, this was a, a little summary of the things I talked about. Um, and I, I, you know, whenever I, I'm giving a talk, I always encourage people uh, to pick out one or two and just ask yourself if you're really doing that. You know, is there some way that you can benefit? I look at these and I, I know I can benefit from these today. So now I have a little film. Um, which uh, is going to be a much more entertaining than I'm ever going to be. Uh, and it summarizes uh, just a handful of the things that we did in May last year for our end of year experience. So uh, it's about three minutes long. <laughs> All the ancillary material for portfolio, the um, audio visuals, everything was amazingly done, amazingly sophisticated. Today was one of the most spectacular days. It was fun. It was such a variety. I was incredibly impressed today. I, there were a lot of really great designers. Our students are pushing the boundaries. You're really going to see the great things that our students can create. I'm so proud to, to have been a part of Parsons. Together, all of you have raised $1,400,000 in scholarship money for our students. Oh, you look so good in this dress. Do you want to announce the designers of the year? Juliana Reggiana. Chris Lee. Jin Woo Kim. Congratulations to everybody.
never leave Parsons. <laughs>